Hello, everyone. We are joined today by Dr. Evan Katz, who is a leading researcher and chiropractor who specializes in upper cervical cranial instability. So today we're taking questions from the community regarding his research, DMX scans, cranial cervical instability, and all the crazy things that can hap happen to our upper cervical ligament, and seeing if we can get some answers and guidance to this patient population. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Katz. Thanks for having me. So this is the third part of a three-part series. So part one, we were talking about, um, well, part two, we were talking about how to read a DMX scan. And then part one, we were talking about the research that Dr. Katz was doing with upper cervical instability. So check out those videos if you haven't seen them. So Dr. Katz, let's jump right into it. First question here is, is it possible that sometimes ALR bending overhang numbers can change to show a higher number after a PICL procedure than the previous DMX scan. And this was actually my case. I had a DMX scan where after my procedure, my overhang numbers were larger. Well, it, obviously, as you all know, with this injury, anything is possible. Um, and unfortunately, when we talk about ligamentous injuries, there's a number of research that talks about ligament injuries and abnormal mechanics that will unfortunately will get will get worse if left untreated so just because you get a picl procedure you have someone try to restore your curve doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to work and it doesn't mean that over time it can't get worse now the hard part is if we do see it get more and let's say it got another millimeter or two millimeters as time went on maybe it was supposed to be three to four millimeters and that actually did help prevent it from increasing another 20 or 50 percent we don't know so of course it's it's possible because you're dealing with a very movable structure and we're trying to which is the cervical spine and we're trying to add add instability to an area that is already unstable so the likelihood that it could get worse even with doing all the right things is high and that's as you all know that have this that's the hard part of this injury it's not like you're going to do one thing or see you know see me just once and it's all going to go away it's what can we do to improve it and not just get it better? What are the things we could do to prevent it from prevent it from getting worse? So yeah, it is possible. That's great. Uh, hopefully people don't see that happen, but I know in my case, there could be something going on that we just don't understand yet because I was feeling better, but my overhang was, well, I had a larger overhang number. So. Right. And, and you're, and there isn't, you know, always a correlation at the higher the overhang. We know where the instability and stability region is, but if it goes higher, maybe there are some areas that improved and that got healthier, so that minimized some of your pain, um, you know, pain fibers. So you felt better, but maybe you had a little bit more movement. Got it. Yeah. So let's shift over to talk about DMX scans, because I know this is definitely your field of expertise. So can you tell me what makes a DMX scan better in terms of quality? Uh, I think that would have to be the person running the machine. You know, if we all have the same machines and they're all calibrated appropriately in every place, um, does have the state come in and look at it, which they all should, you know, ours we have to pay the state, the state physicist to come in once a year to calibrate it and we can monitor it. So we want to make sure that they're, they're calibrated, that they're working appropriately. Um, but if all those are, are the same, then it comes down to the technician and that's the person taking the DMX. Are they taking the time when they're taking the, the image? Do they, are they paying attention to what they're looking for and what they're supposed to be looking for? Or is it just, someone trying to do it really quick or they trained a tech to do it, but they really don't know what they're looking for. So, you know, in our office, it's my wife and I, we're both docs and one of us will shoot the videos usually, you know, and uh, usually it's Dr. Shauna, many times it's me, but we're looking while we're doing it of what we're supposed to be seeing and can we see it clearly because then we're also the ones to measure it. So I think it comes down with all those other, you know, technology being the same it comes down to the technician, the person that's actually shooting the image. So is it fair to say that most of the times if a DMX scan is not usable by Regenex, it's because of the, tech, the technician and not the equipment? Yeah, usually we've seen, 
you know, when we Gen X has sent someone in here for a DMX and they already had one, we're always curious, you know, so we're like, can we see it? And usually every once in a while we have seen this where someone has, because digital motion x-ray is also considered, it's a form of fluoroscopy. And hospitals have fluoro units when they, you know, they do surgery, they do injections and you can see it moving. The issue is when you try to really move it like a DMX, it gets what's called ghosty and you kind of, you know, it, it's almost like someone's hallucinating and you see trails. Um, and people will try to do that. And you can't, you can't see the borders well enough. So that, that could be they're just using the wrong machine. But then other times we see where they just, uh, you know, when we mentioned this a little bit on the second video of this three part is they just rush it. And sometimes they don't even, they don't even do a full scan. So you don't even see all the views that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be getting. And so what views should you be getting? So the views that we should always be getting is um, we start with a nodding view. So we're looking at um, we're looking at a nodding a nodding view. So we're looking at how the skull actually um, nods on top of C one. So you can check some of the from the front or the side from the side. From the side. So like so this. No, nope, that's flexion extension. It's this. Okay. So okay. Okay. So that. View. Yep. So we're trying to look at like the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane and the, even a little bit of the tectoral membrane, and then we do a flexion extension view. So okay. ADI. Yep. Down and up, and then we do. We a lot of times we have them tuck their chin as they go down to kind of look at some more of the coupling motion. Yep. And then from there we can measure some of the upper cervical spine and then the rest of the cervical spine in terms of you know flexion and extension, angulation, and then even in our paper, we even looked at what's called spinous process engagement, how well the vertebrae are moving. Um, and then from there, we do an oblique flexion extension. So it's oblique with your head turned, and you do flexion extension. And this way, we can really see the facet joints. We can see the intervertebral foramens. We can look to see if some of the uh, facet joints are unstable, and sometimes they can go into the joint. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you this, because this was a... Um, this was a paper, let's see if this actually works. This is a paper I actually wrote up, got asked to write up for a nursing journal. Hold on one sec, I can't move this. There we go. Um, no, not that, how do I get rid of that thing? Um, and you can see here, so we got this published in, um, uh, what is it called, the um, a, a Journal of Legal Nurse Consulting. And it was a whole thing on DMX. And you can look to see, in certain movements, we can sometimes see gapping of the facet joints. Um, and then of course, you know, here's kind of what we looked at as it relates to, this is just the whole the paper that we wrote up for them. Um, so let me get back to stop and sh stop share. Okay, so yeah, so then, and then from there, we do an A to B view where we have them tilt. So again, we can look at how the vertebras move. We look at the facet joints. And then we do the open mouth view, which is where we're really looking at those accessory and ALR ligaments through the open mouth. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's my least favorite move. <laughs> get a I flare up, or get a flare up for two weeks. Yeah. So I for know. all of you listening who have never had a DMX scan before, it might cause a flare up of your symptoms, and just be ready for that. <laughs> and it may just because we're we're you know, so many people that are hurt, they don't move, and they're trying to protect that instability. And we, in order to see instability, you have to move, which is again, why, you know, when you look at um, MRIs, they're great for so many things, but you're not moving or you're still this, we really, you know, and if someone comes in and they're like, I can't move, then we can't really do the DMX because we're going to get a false, a potential false negative. Like you can't move and we have to, we have to get the, we have to measure the joint through a full range of motion. Yep. So tell me, are there any questions that we can ask a technician before they do a DMX scan to know if they're going to do it correctly, besides maybe asking them what sequences they're going to do and making sure that they do all the things that you just mentioned? Um, you can certainly ask if they have their machine inspected by the state, um, how often, you know, if they get it once a year, when was the last time? And then you, I wouldn't be afraid to ask who's shooting the film. You know, is it one of the docs or is it a tech? And if it's the tech, have they been trained not just to shoot it, but trained to have an idea of what the doc should be looking for? So 
they know what to zero in on and what not to. Like if we're, if we're shooting the image and let's say Dr. Shauna is shooting it and she sees something that we know is an issue, she's kind of probably, you know, narrow in on that, on that site as opposed to someone just like, okay, go ahead and go and just having you go through the motions, literally. Mm -hmm. so, so perhaps so, if the doctor isn't running it, a good practice could be to make sure that the doctor reviews it before you even leave the facility. Before you leave, yeah, is to show everything that you need, speed and everything, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So we talked about this already, but one of the questions that came in was, uh, can just any chiropractor or radiologist do a DMX or do they require special training? So um, we're all, all chiropractors and radiologists are um, trained in reading DMXs. It's part of our state board or malpractice covers it, but it doesn't mean that we all know what we're looking at, right? Like, um, like for instance, there's, there's a lot of docs that are, I, I had to go through pediatrics. I'm not really great with babies, right? It's a whole separate thing. So docs may understand it, but they just don't do it. So they're not going to be as familiar. And in terms of radiologists, every radiologist that I've spoken to, and we've had, you know, we have the head, we have the head radiologist at the hospital here and he'll read them if we need them. Cause he's like, yeah, man, it's, we see this all the time. The issue is, and this is gonna sound super messed up, the reason that it's hard for them to do it is it takes a really long time to read a DMX. And from a hospital financial perspective, he's like, I can read five MRIs in the time it takes me to do one of these. Um, so most of them can do it, it's just a matter of will they? You know, and so we're, yeah. Is there some sort of additional uh, training or certification or something that patients can look for? So we actually have um, training, I'm looking at my wall, it's called Functional Imaging and Anatomy Certificate, and that was basically on the DMX. And then in the state of Colorado, we also, for our machine, we took another test just on being able to utilize um, video fluoro. Uh, so they could ask that, or you could ask, what other training have you had other than just having it in your office? I would also seriously ask them, um, if they have a DMX and they are not aware of our paper, then they're not paying attention, right? So I would ask, are you aware of Dr. Katz's uh, DMX paper? And if they say, yeah, we totally like, okay, you're gonna add in those findings as well. And if they Absolutely. don't, they're not aware of it and they have a DMX, then maybe you look somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, good so, point. Yeah, but, but if they have it and this is, this is shown more than any other paper, I'd, I'd, be, I'd wonder well, how do you not know about this? Like you have one. Yeah. Yeah. So can a DMX spot a complete rupture of a ligament? So that's another really good question. Um, no, the only thing I can really look at a complete rupture is an MRI. However, and we talked a little bit about this on in the second video, it doesn't matter from a, from a, well, something always matters to a degree, but what matters is how stable is the joint. Right, so you can have a ligament that on MRI looks attached, just like a rubber band that you don't know how flexible it is. So you could have a, a ligament that looks on an MRI, it's okay, but the area is totally unstable because as you stretch it, it just lost its, its ability to hold. Now, if it's completely ruptured and you see that on an MRI, then most likely that area is also gonna be unstable through a full range of motion. So we, we're looking at the DMX, I won't say, that area is completely disrupted. I'm gonna say that area is no longer stable. And they could say, well, does that mean it's disrupted? I, to me, it doesn't matter if it's disrupted or overstretched. I, I know that it's no, it no longer has its uh, stability component left. Yeah, it doesn't matter because what we care about is the instability. So who cares yeah, if it's ruptured or not? And I'm not gonna talk for Dr. Centeno, and we've talked about this. Does it matter for his procedure with better outcomes? I don't know if he knows that yet. Right, like I'm sure, I'm sure from a physiological perspective, if it's just overstretched, maybe it'll have better outcomes with the PICL, maybe than if it's a complete rupture because you still have it; it's still attached at the origin insertion. So that could be the next big thing that we look at: is okay, you're unstable, and now let's look at the instability. Is it unstable and overstretched, or is it unstable and completely ruptured? And then let's look at the outcomes of some of these patients. But that's a whole other you know, on the chapter.
So follow up here talking about ligaments and instability, and it might be a question that we just don't have the answer for yet, but can damage to the posterior ligaments only, so we're not talking about the you know ones between the skull and C1 and, and C2, but the posterior, could posterior ligament damage be the cause of craniocervical instability, assuming that there's not also ligament damage in the upper cervical region? Oh yeah, you can damage the posterior ligaments and and get instability as well, more than just the anterior. So you know, and and again, that's the thing with the papers looking at you know thirty seven different parameters, not just A and B. It's side to side, front and back, rotational, um, because you know the the cranial cervical junction isn't just held together by anterior ligaments. It's also you have ligaments on the side, you have ligaments on the back so you can without a doubt have a disruption of the posterior ligaments and still and have instability you know you have something called um, the posterior lanoaccipital occipital membrane and the posterior lanoaxial axial membrane and if those get disrupted you can get too much angulation and that's an un, that's an unstable cranial cervical junction you may not have translation um, through the mouth but you're getting instability between the posterior arch of C1 and C1 and C2, and that's still an unstable cranial cervical junction. Yeah, so all the ligaments sort of work well together, and this is probably why Regenex is so big on injecting the posterior every time. Yeah, the one they're they're easy to get to as well, right? They're not as invasive, they're really easy to get to. Um, you know, and and you have to look, you know, and I think also if we just look, if I just looked at C1 and not looked at above and below it and other things that can affect it, I think you can be missing stuff too. And that's what they look at as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about why a DMX scan is so important for diagnosing and understanding instability in the upper cervical region. But let's talk about MRIs. What are the benefits of getting an MRI? What can you see on an MRI that you can't see on a DMX? Yeah. So. An MRI, I, I really like because you know, especially in the craniocervical junction, you're looking at um, you know, you look to see if the cerebellar tonsils are below the frame of magnum, which could be a, a form of Chiari, um, which you, you're not going to see on uh, DMX, and you can also see the the shape of the cord and if it's being abutted or bumped. Um, and sometimes, it, you know, what we do here a lot of times is if we see instability on a certain angle or plane line, we try to work with the MRI center here to put them in that exact position and look to see what's happening in that during that, that problem. So an MRI, you're going to see some of the soft tissue itself, like, okay, what is the brainstem doing? What is the spinal cord doing? What are the discs doing? Um, where in the, in the DMX, you're going to look at what are the bones doing through movement. And a lot of times they're both necessary and you could take that piece and that piece and put them together to come up with a really good clinical picture and then of course with the history of the patient and what they're feeling and are patients better off getting an upper cervical m or sorry in an upright mri as opposed to laying down mri i think for these yeah um because you know there is there is some really good studies to show that upright mris are more sensitive to seeing these biomechanical abnormalities and you know a lot of a lot of patients we ask like okay what do you do to feel better a lot of them will just go home and lay down right so like i don't want to see what your spine looks like in your most comfortable position it sounds messed up but i want to see what happens when like oh my god when i do this it hurts well let's have you do that as opposed to like okay we'll just stay here and don't move now we don't know what it looks like from this so i like upright just because we're uh you know, it's a bio, we're a biomechanical structure and structure dictates function. And I want to see what that structure looks like under load because most of the day you're under load. You're sitting, you're standing, you're upright, you're walking, you're driving, you're working out, you're, yeah. And most people are like, okay, when it gets real bad, I lay down. Like, okay. And then, and then you do an image with you laying down and then it comes back and says, we don't see anything. It's like, yeah, you just took it out of my most comfortable position. Let's see what yeah. I, I don't feel good. Yeah. Yep. Though I'm sure many upper cervical instability patients wish they could spend their whole day laying down. Laying down, I know, I know, and and not moving. And then there's, but then there's another clinical problem that goes along with that too. Because the less you move, the more 
deconditioned the area gets, the more atrophy that occurs, and then the area also can become less stable on top of that. And then the joints aren't moving, and then they're getting more dehydrated. It's a horrible cycle, you know? It's a horrible, horrible cycle. Use it or lose it. So yeah. next question here has to do with normal x-rays, not DMXs. So we know yeah. that DMXs are superior in pretty much every way for diagnosing, but uh, are there any benefits to using a single x-ray, particularly when you're looking for alar ligament damage or healing to be able to assess alar healing over time, just doing an open mouth side bending x-ray? So, you know, I always... Let's see, I'll, I'll be as politically correct as I can. Um, we start with just static x-rays. We don't do the open mouth lateral bending. Now, anything that I see on a DMX to a degree, you can see on a static x-ray, right? Because a, a fluoro or DMX are x-rays being shot at a continuous wave, and then it's like taking a bunch of x-rays in like a flip book, right? So, let's say you tilt on x-ray and you see some instability or you see a lot of instability you can say that that area is unstable but what i caution about that is the likelihood of missing that upper cervical instability or let's hype or the exact amount of measurement is really high so i don't know why we'd want to do that you can you can and i mean like so what i mean by that is let's say we'll take you for instance and you we do just a static x-ray and it's really hard to get and we're like oh you're at three millimeters and we're like oh my gosh you have three millimeters of instability but let's say because on the dmx we see as you move it now moved another millimeter and a half and now you're at 4.5 millimeters now clinically what does that mean well clinically you're you went from unstable to really unstable but let's say we didn't have a full picture and now we think you're at three millimeters. And then you do all this treatment and then we do a DMX and now you're at 3.8 millimeters. Well, really you're at 4.5, you got better, but for just having a static view, it looks like you got worse because we didn't have the, the most detailed image that we could take of you. Hold on a second. Anyone here? Yeah, okay. okay, I'll see, I'll see it. So that's why I think it's, like you can do it, but you're not nearly as accurate. So why? Like, cause to really, truly trying to get, as you know, and a lot of CCI know, to truly get a good picture of the CCI um, or the cranial cervical junction, it's hard. And, and we're talking millimeters. Like, do you know how small a millimeter is? Yeah. Between two millimeters and three millimeters and three millimeters and four millimeters isn't a lot in our world, but in your upper cervical spine, it's a ton. So why do you want to potentially do this and be like, oh, look, it's unstable, but maybe there's another two millimeters in there that you can't see. So why? It's just not as accurate. Yeah, and especially if you do have instability in your healing, if you're doing a static x-ray, it's usually the doctor coming in saying, put your head this one way, they go over, and then you're just holding it in this really uncomfortable position for 30 seconds, whereas in a DMX, you're moving the entire time. So right. you might not get the full range of motion, like you said. And we, we showed on the other one, um, in the second video, when you do it, how much a little movement can make a big change. And that's the things that we're looking for, right? Is to see like, oh my gosh, look, here's where you would stop with a regular x-ray. And then we have you move and we see little intricacies that can make a gigantic difference. Like, oh my gosh, it's actually five millimeters and not three. Two, two extra millimeters is a lot and, and something you want to know about. So mm -hmm. in short, yeah, you could, but the likelihood of missing it goes up and getting the accurate measurement when dealing with cervical, you know, the cranial cervical junction, why do you want to potentially miss a couple millimeters? Yeah. And why get, uh, why get a picture that is potentially inaccurate and going to send you down a rabbit hole or make you believe something that's just not true. Right. Or, you know, the other thing I tell these docs that I see, they're posting like, Oh, I did this x-ray and I'm like, do this an x-ray is if the, if they see evidence, I don't care if it's two millimeter or seven millimeters on x-ray, they need to refer you out for DMX. Like, let's just make sure this is accurate and get as much detail as we can. Why they don't send out, I don't know. That's, that's, uh, we could probably do a whole other podcast on that. 
So a uh, quick opinion question here. Do you think that every upper cervical chiropractic, Blair, Nuka, AO, pick your, pick your poison here, should they all be doing DMXs in your opinion? You know, not on every patient, you know, um, and, and we don't do a DMX on every patient either, unless we really think they have upper cervical instability. Right. So if all the upper cervical docs, um, you know, they're treating you and you're doing well then great. But if they think you truly have upper cervical instability, then yeah, I don't care what type of doctor you are. I don't care if you're upper cervical, you do what I do, which is like, which is CVP. If you do Gonstead, if you think the person is unstable, um, send them for a DMX. Or if you really look at the paper, when we looked at it, um, for patients with still having neck pain, six weeks or longer. If they're still having unresolved neck pain that's not getting better, the likelihood that they have some form of instability is pretty high and the way to really identify it is on DMX. So, and it's changed our practice. We used to not do that. Um, and now I'm like, okay, if a patient has neck pain after six weeks and it's still lingering based on this paper, like the standard is like, okay, we should DMX them. So I don't think that they should DMX you right away, right out of the gate, but if there's you're not getting better or they really think that you have upper cervical instability regardless of what um, technique they do, whether it's upper cervical or not, then yeah, they should do a DMX and Z. Yeah, or for listeners out there, if you get a NUCA or upper cervical adjustment and you feel great and then the second you walk out the door, you hear a pop and you go out of alignment, you you know you have instability and you should probably get a DMX. Yeah, it's not, you're just not gonna, like what? Yeah, they're not gonna know and you're just not gonna right. know. You're not gonna know. Yeah, I don't like guessing. So next question here, the next series of questions are a little technical. Uh, yeah. Here's the first one. So many patients present with significant and persistent C2 rotation. And I know I have that. I can just feel it. It's a, I think it's like you know, 15 yeah. degrees off. Um, is that rotation, in your view, caused by loose ligaments or rather by the left to right imbalance in the muscles that connect to the C2 spinous process, uh, such as the obliquus capitis inferior and the rectus capitis posterior major, or probably some combination of both? I think it's more, and there have been studies on this, a lot of it is more ligamentous, but also some can be uh, those upper cervical ligaments and like even like the multifidus after an injury, some of those muscles can start to go into fatty infiltration. And then you do get some less stability. So with rotation, I think it's a, it's a good combination of both with ligaments being a little bit higher up there. So what do you mean by that? They go into the fatty, like they're not used anymore because the yeah, ligament so isn't working? So there's, um, there's a lot of research, probably for the last decade, maybe a little bit more, that they're finding a lot on MRI and chronic pain patients, uh, fatty infiltration of the multifidus muscles and the muscles start to, like the area is unstable, the area is injured, and it just starts to die. And the muscles just start to die. And we, you know, then you wanna to start to build those muscles up as well. So it's looking at all that. Yes, it could be muscular, but most likely, in my experience, it's the ligaments, even the capsules, as that person, you know, it was a great question, as those capsules get damaged, there's just abnormal mechanical information and abnormal stability, and then the muscles start to they start to die or get atrophied. Or, you know, your head is forward, you get more contraction here, and then these muscles won't contract. Right? So like if you try to contract your bicep, your tricep usually shuts off or else your arm won't move. So if you're trying to stabilize a bunch here, what's gonna happen to the muscles behind? They're gonna be relaxed because these are contracted. Mm -hmm. So we've got a follow-up question, which is very similar. So in your typical DMX scans, you document rotation of the C2 spinous process during lateral side bending. When outside of normal limits, what do you think it is a sign of? Is it a sign of alar ligament stretching or, and I'm sorry, I don't know what this means, RCP, major left or right imbalance? Yeah, that's the rectus capitis posterior. I think it's um, with tilting, I think a lot of it is capsular with the capsular ligaments and a little bit of the alar ligaments as well. Mm -hmm. that Got it. Yep. Got it. So I know we, well in the... oh, I'm on number three, but I'm going to jump back up to number two here. Cause that was okay. that okay. Third question was related to the, the first one. So next question here, we are talking awesome. about uh, x-ray exposure with DMX scan. So what's the typical or average <laughs> DMX scan x-ray radiation exposure for a cervical patient? Uh, for instance, so, for a 90 second cervical scan. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm gonna show, show the actual, this is from the manufacturer, 
And then we also, as I said, we also have that information from the um, from our our physicists. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'll just show you. This is from the manufacturer. Hold on one sec. Can you see? Yes. Okay. So this is uh, again from the manufacturer. Static X-ray. This is taking one static cervical X-ray, and this is uh, DMX, right? So this is just one real quick um, picture. So, but and you can see it's actually less on the DMX. So let's go to what most people try to uh, look at. Okay, um, and this is a standard uh, seven Davis view, and seven views is lateral A to P lateral flexion extension cervical view on x-ray and what they found is that that's about 777 um, uh, MR like looking at how much x-ray uh, and to get seven x-rays and on DMX it's actually 672 but the camera takes 30 frames a second for 90 seconds and that's 2700 x-rays so you're it's lower it's lower now that's for 90 seconds sometimes the, the full DMX might take two or three minutes, um, but even if you, you know, even if you double that, you're around, you know, let's say 1,000, 1,200, if, you know, so you're not going to be quite as high, you're going to get 4,000 x-rays for not much more than a regular static uh, 7 series. And that's what we started to do as well, is we'll, we'll minimize it as well, too. So if we, we'll, we'll cut this time a lot of times, um, where if, let's say we do one or two passes and we don't see anything, we're not doing a third pass. And a lot of times if we see something right away, like if we see that that really translates over, we get a great view, we'll probably do it twice. But if we see that we're not doing it a third time to keep those numbers even lower. So it's not a ton and not nearly as close as what, you know, a lot of people really think. Um, and it is pretty, you know, it's, it's less than a CT scan, obviously an MR is magnets, but it's not, it's not a, a ton. That's great. A lot yeah. lower. I, I, you know, I see a lot of patients talking about it and very worried about it. And that's always been my impression was that it's actually not as high as we thought. Do you no, think it's just miscommunication thing, or education? What's, what's going on with that? You know, I think it's just, I don't know. I, I don't know. And I think also, and I don't want to get into this, but, you know, look up hormesis. And hormesis is, you know, the study of like x-rays and what it does on your body. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that it's really not even that bad. You know, if you do it, once a year, twice a year, it's not that bad. I'm not saying you should, you know, stand in front of it and try to warm up your coffee or something like that, but you know, it's not that, it's not a lot. Don't go chew on uranium, you'll probably be okay. <laughs> right, especially living here in Boulder where, you know, the sun and everything, we have so much radiation here to begin with the sun and the rocks and, you know, so yeah. Gotcha. I was at the School of Mines uh, garage sale and they had a whole section of radioactive uh, materials and they had the Geiger counters going off. It's like, okay, we're not going to go to that section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so another technical question here. I'm, I'm going to read it. It's number four. Our understanding of how the ALR damage is expressed during lateral bending is as follows. During lateral bending, the larger C1, C2 lateral mass overhang on one side signifies that the alar ligament on that same side is stretched more than the other side. And during head rotation without lateral bending, it is the opposite side of the alar, alar ligament that acts as the limiting factor for the rotation. Uh, so with rotation to that left, it is the right alar ligament that limits that motion. Can you confirm this? So side bending, I think saying side bending, it's the same ligament rotation is the opposite side ligament so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch my screen again here too and I'll show you this here okay can you see that yes okay so this is looking at the back of the neck okay um, so they cut out these bones here um, and they removed obviously the spinal cord and the brain stem so we're looking at the back of this is the back of the transverse ligament. As you can see, it attaches to C1. These here are the alar ligaments. Um, and this is the accessory ligament from C1 to C2. So when you tilt, right, so let's just, let's say, so this is a little cartoon showing a, a tear, okay? When you tilt, it's the opposite side ligaments, right? So just think about it, these were ropes. If you were holding, 
if you were standing right here with a rope attached to a boulder and the boulder was leaning this way, you holding it is going to keep it from falling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let go of the rope, it's going to continue to fall this way. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. it's the side ligament holding it in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that but make certainly, sense? But certainly if there's some forward and backward with the side, then that could come into play though. What could come into play? The this, this ligament on the same side, if you were going back inside or front inside versus just neutral inside, right? Sure. I mean, if you start to, you know, if you start to couple the motions, yeah, you're going to bring in a lot of different ligaments. But on the DMX, when we have you do these movements, we're trying to minimize you from looking forward and bending as well. If we have you do that movement, then yes, we can, we're going to add that in. But looking where the question was, if it tilts to the side, it's the it's the opposite side that's holding it in. Mm -hmm. So if you're so, so if it tilts to the left and it's um, unstable with left lateral bending, the likelihood is that the right ligaments, the alar uh, accessory ligaments, are damaged. Got it. Mm -hmm. Right. And because what about the rotation? Holding. And the rotation, you know, you. The rotation is going to be a lot of the capsules, like what that person said, he or she. Um, you're going to get a lot of the facet capsules where, you know, looking here should keep some of that in check too. But if you're rotating and it just continues to keep going, you're going to, a lot of it is going to be the facet capsules. And we'll see that too. And we noticed that in the study, the facet gapping as well. And, and as it rotates, yes, um, looking at, the uh like the transverse or even a little bit of the accessory and alar that could be the same side as you rotate right so if you're if you're rotating to the left and you see it continue to go forward on the right then it's those right ligaments those same side ligaments does that make Got sense it. yep makes sense okay they're like ropes they're right. Yeah. I mean, I always say to patients, a lot of us were like cables and pulleys, right? Whether it's muscles or ligaments, if you're supposed to have a normal curve and you don't, and you're putting pressure, what happens? One area is going to become compressed. The other is going to become longer. And then in order to hold it, what's going to happen? You're going to go into this mild spasm reflex and you're in this, it's cables and pulleys, you know? And once you start to disrupt that, um, whether due to abnormal alignment, whether due to instability, that structure becomes less stable and has to expend a lot more energy keeping you up. And that's why a lot of patients with instability, like the end of the day, they're holding up their head. They've had these constant spasms that, you know, keep going is because it's been trying to, it's been trying to protect it and trying to stabilize that area all day. They shouldn't have mm -hmm. to contract it all day. And then mm -hmm. here, humans, you know, why can't I do this here? Um, again, this is looking down. The transverse ligament these are the accessories from c2 um, to the skull and here's c1 and then the alar ligaments also hold on to from c1 to c2 so it's this whole region got it got it so how important is c7 t1 to this c1 c2 stability what about the t-spine if we fix the top and the bottom uh if we fix the top is is that going to be sufficient for the rest of the spine to heal or will it not be perfect and we're going to have to go in and maybe do injections in c7 t1 and lower below oh i think and there there's a ton it's incredibly important and there's something called the sva um it's a sagittal vertical axis. Like you can't, you, it all needs to be looked at. Right. And that's what we do in our office is we look at that whole structure. We try to restore that whole structure. It's not just C1. And there's also, you know, sacral base angles down your low back has been shown to really affect the mid and upper cervical spine. So you really need to address it all. I mean, and that's what we do as a whole. We look at it all. It's not just like, Oh, C1 is unstable, we're just gonna work on C1. We're gonna look at you know, the cervical thoracic junction, we're gonna look at the mid cervical spine, above and below, all of it, to just try to aid in, in stability. Because you, you know, if everything is off and you just keep working on C1, you're, you know, as we mentioned before, it's all cables and pulleys to a degree. It's just gonna to continue to cause this domino effect. So no, we're, we're, 
huge believers of really analyzing all of it and trying to fix it all and trying to have it all work together because it all does work together. Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's a lot of patients that they never had hip problems till their necks started hurting. And then um, for me, it's just been incredible to see all of these things in my body that I didn't think were related at all. But my right foot pain, my right hip pain, my right thoracic region pain, and all of that yeah. just starts going away after the injections. Like, wow, who, who knew? Yeah, how it relates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So... One question we've got here is when's the right time to start a spinal curve restoration? Should we do it in the beginning, at the end of recovery? Are the muscles just going to be tight if there's instability, so it's a waste of time anyways? No, we, we I mean, look, the majority of our, a lot of our patients, once we start a good curve restoration program, get better, right? That's why we're still in businesses. And that's, and again, we talked about this in, um, I think it was either in one or two, maybe both of the videos, we just submitted a paper where we improved upper cervical instability by restoring, by restoring the curve. Um, Why is that? Well, you got to think about if you have an abnormal sagittal alignment, let me try, here, let me try to jump ahead and let me try to get something while I'm talking to you and I'll I'll try to give a a sneak peek without saying what journal was sent into. Um, Here, I'm going to push, I'm going to get this. Let me just see while we're talking. Well, one, you got to think about what's actually happening to the cervical spine and if it's unstable. So, all right, so here, I'll show you here. Um, Here, let me pull this up. Hold on one sec. Um, Okay, let me just share the screen here. And then I'll, I'll show you. So our hypothesis has always been when you have an abnormal cervical curve, can you see this? Yep. This is just don't share this to whoever's watching, but this is what we sent in. um, And this is just part of it. Um, So we took a bunch of patients with abnormal cervical curves and then we restored their cervical curve. We improved the cervical curve. Not everyone did. And we wanted to see what would happen to their upper cervical instability. And all these patients had upper cervical instability. You can see from here to here and from here to here. And what we did is this is before and after. They had upper cervical instability, and then we restored their cervical curve, and they had less instability. So when we look, if we look at, let's say, some of this here, these patients initially had eight millimeters to one side and six to the other, and then after- That's treatment, big. That's a lot. That's big. That's a lot. That's more and than they, I had. Yeah, and they only had 14 degree curve, and then after treatment, we doubled their curve, and it went from eight millimeters to six, and on one side, it went from six to two. Another patient had seven and a half millimeters and 1.8 to one side. They only had a, a curve of four, of four degrees. We improved their curve to 23 degrees, and then it went from seven to two millimeters, and, one, and we did that on multiple, multiple patients. So you can kind wow. of see what happened, and we, we had this analysis that as we improved their curve, we minimized instability. And they, here's all the patients that we did it on. Um, so with all that, why? Well, think about when you have an abnormal cervical curve. If you abnormal cervical curve, we're looking at from the side, you have a buckling. And in order to continue to see straight, if you had a buckling, you'd be looking down at the floor. But in order to see straight, you put an increased extension at the skull base. Well, if you have damage of the alar ligaments, what's happening? You're constantly loading it. It's not going to heal. So what we did is by restoring the curve, increasing the balance of the skull those load are no longer under stress and strain and they can start to heal and that's what we try to do with a lot of patients that undergo the procedure with regenx um is do they also have an abnormal curve and if they do well let's try to fix that as well they're both pathologies they're both problems they're both very well you know documented and especially you know loss of the curve is a is a huge is a huge huge issue that not a lot of docs try to fix, you know, CBP docs do, but that's about it. And so it's not, so I, I think there's a lot of confusion on this topic then within the community, because this is the first time that I've ever heard this. And I think a lot of patients believe, and I believed myself that I had a curve and then I had an injury and then that injury called, caused my neck to tighten and that caused my neck to get straighter. But I think what you're saying is like, well, 
you might have had a straight or straight neck before and that just made everything worse and you didn't heal as well that and, and trauma is also very well documented to cause a buckling of the neck you know every every car crash that's ever been looked at by a mechanically yale did it causes an s-shaped curve in the mid phase of the crash um, and then if your neck gets stuck that way which a lot of times it does, and no one's tried to fix it, it, one, it's weaker, and it just leads to more and more issues. Now, you can have both, right? And that's the thing where in some of these forums, you see people like, do I have upper cervical instability? I feel this and this, is upper cervical instability can cause a lot of problems, but a lot of things in the neck can cause problems as well. And sometimes you have just one, and sometimes you have all four, or 10, or five you need to be able to address that and see like i look at it if we see someone with massive upper cervical instability and a cervical kyphosis i'm like wow that cervical kyphosis needs to be addressed yeah not doing and, yourself any favors you're not doing yourself any favors and the outcomes are going to be bad and all the research not all i'm sure you'll find like a study on smoking isn't bad for you <laughs> Most of the research shows that abnormal cervical curves lead to, i mean journal of neurosurgery shows that it'll lead to further disability and pain and degeneration and all these other problems. So it needs to be addressed. And that's, that's the focus in our office. And what we found with the years of seeing this is as we start to improve the curve and try to aid in that stability, a lot of the symptomatology of upper cervical spine can go away. And, you know, and, and then when you get the pickle procedure, it's fantastic. And then we look at it as, all right, as it's trying to heal, let's try to work on the mechanics to improve the overall curve of the spine, to minimize the amount of stress in that upper cervical spine. Plus, abnormal cervical curves are shown to be weaker. So that area, if that area is already weak and you want to strengthen it, you don't fix the curve, that whole structure as a unit is weaker to begin with. So you're more susceptible to further injury. So yeah. fix but most chiropractors don't. A lot of them, you know, this will make me sound like a jerk, but I've, I've been doing it too long and they, Sean and I get so frustrated is, you know, these chiropractors will take x-rays and like, oh, you have a loss of curve, but they're not implementing in any, any treatment that's actually been shown to help. So what, what will help? What kind of chiropractor? Uh, what, what uh, chiropract, uh, a technique called chiropractic biophysics has been shown to help. And uh, you, know, you try to find one of those docs and ask, do you do CBP? Like you've been in our office, right? We haven't treated you yet, but you've seen the stuff that we have. Like that, it takes, it takes a lot of time in a CBP office to get treated. So, you know, and, and you know, obviously there's great upper cervical docs that um, do fantastic jobs. But when you're saying you have a loss of the cervical curve, there is a way that you can start to improve it. What, what is your opinion on those foam blocks and wedges? I mean, uh, I think I've got, you I've got one over here. I've got one at home. Um, something like this guy. Yeah, so those, I'm not a huge fan. There, there's, there's a really good cervical orthosis through CBP that's been published a lot. And it all depends. Like that's something you could buy on the internet. Like your neck, that may not be good for your neck. Like look at this, look at that thing. It's going to push your head forward. Right. Like you, with your neck, I could say like, no, I wouldn't even put you on that. I, I give you something else that's been, you know, really researched and shown to really help. Um, but that no way, no way. Well, that's great. This is, this is my biggest takeaway of this whole conversation is about the curve restoration. I've got to look into it. Yeah. Um, so next question here, we're, we're almost done. So thank you again so much yeah, for your time so far. Um, do you have any opinion on when the C1, C2 overhang can be reduced with upper facet injections alone? Uh, this person who submitted the question says that she knows of a woman who had more than seven millimeters of bilateral overhang, and that was reduced to about one and a half and four millimeters over the course of 20, that's, that's a lot, 20 <laughs> rounds of posterior PRP injections. What is that, it's like $10,000, $20,000 of injections? No, I was thinking that too. It's like, it's a lot of money. I, when I read that last night, I was like, whoa. So, I mean, look, if you, if you pump in a bunch of blood 20 times and tighten everything up, it could totally reduce it. But are you also reducing all the other joints and then you just minimize range of motion? I, you know, and again, you know, 20 rounds of PRP, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a time and a place, but yeah, what is that? Like, that's probably like 50, 60 grand, right? 
That's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but let's take the money out of it. Like it, it's, it's a tech lot longer. Yeah. It's not solving the yeah. problem. It's, 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 it's really, I mean, really heavy duty duct tape in the wrong area, but it's working, but it's working. But also you got to think when you till, when you tilt, um, there is going to be some facet capsular damage. So let's say you go ahead and just tighten up all the facet capsules. It's, you're not going to be able to till and it will theoretically hold it in. Probably, probably not recommended though. 20, because you got to think 20 rounds of posterior PRP, let's say they did four on each side. That's eight each time. So that's, what is that? That's 320 areas of PRP. So it's a lot of poking. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. So, um, so last question here, Dr. Katz. Um, for those who don't know, myself included, first part is what is cranial settling? And second part is, do you think that stem cell treatments to the posterior and PICL can help with cranial settling? Um, well, I, I just want to be sure cranial settling, I wonder if they mean because reading is sinking onto the neck and sinking onto the neck is what's called like basilar invagination. You don't want that. So hopefully that's not what they're talking about. Um, Cause that, that ba a true basilar invagination, usually they traction and then fuse. Um, yeah. And because then the brainstem starts to get crushed by the dent. But I also wonder if they mean, you know, cranial settling, meaning it's when you measure, you have a better like atlas plane angle, um, atlas plane line and a, and a better angle between the skull and C1. Um, so that it's sitting better. Um, so if that's the case, that I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if injecting it would get it to settle and being a better position. Um, I think it also depends on what's happening with the rest of the alignment of the spine and how that sits. Um, uh, so that I don't know. Um, yeah, that I, that I don't know if it would actually, and again, reading the question, um, I'm going to, I'm going to guess that they're saying, will it get the skull to settle into a more neutral position? Um, and that I don't know. I don't know if it will. I think it might just kind of strengthen it. And, and again, if, you know, it could get, well, I guess it could get it to settle as, you know, if you get it to tighten up, it's going to, it could potentially pull it back to where it needs to be as opposed to flopping around. And then you would have potentially a better, um, it, it could be settled if that's what they mean. So I might need some clarification on the question yeah. in the future. And I'd be more than happy to rewrite it. I'd be more than happy to answer it again just to, to make sure I'm getting it right. Well, Dr. Katz, you've been so generous with your time the past few days. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, so yeah. And if anyone has any questions, like, please just reach out. I mean, this is what we love to do. We love to help any way we can. And um, yeah. Katz Chiropractic in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. I think you're yeah. on Spruce Street, right? On Pine. On Pine, Pine. Pine that, Street, yeah. That other tree, the other tree. Yeah, the other tree, right. Pine, there's Mapleton, but Pine, yeah. Right in the middle of Boulder. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week before yeah. my next upper cervical injection. I got to get that scheduled still. But um, are Great. there any parting comments, words of wisdom, inspirational things you'd like to say to this uh, patient, this patient group? Yeah, I say don't, don't give up. You know, don't give up hope. There's a lot of people out there that are willing to help. Um, and I'm sure in my experience with patients that have a cervical instability, it doesn't feel that way because most of the time you're being brushed aside and, you know, hey, if you don't fit in this perfect mold, then the doctor thinks you're crazy, as opposed to, in our opinion, the doctor's just being lazy and not looking at outside the box. And I don't even know how outside the box this really is anymore. There's enough information, but don't give up hope. There's people like me that want to help, you know, Centeno and Schultz and everyone there, they all want to help. And we all understand these injuries. We all want to help you the best we can. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out. You know, it's, I know everything is a little weird with COVID, but you know, we're not far from wherever you are. You know, we have planes and you can always come in. You can, you know, reach us through, you know, internet, email, and we'll do everything we can to help.
Um, but don't give up hope um, and don't just go home and lay down and shut out the world around you because you'll start to go down this really horrible, um, this you know really dark hole and your quality of life is gonna decrease. So look to see what we can do to one, identify it appropriately, try to get people to talk to each other, your providers to talk to get you the best care that you can. Yeah, because awesome. your life is not, it's not a death sentence. You know, it might feel like it, but there's a lot of times and the majority of times that there's a lot that could be done to help. Yeah. And there's more options than just getting a spine fusion. By a lot. And more options than just being given a prescription. Um, mm -hmm. Not going to help it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Katz. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you soon.